Great. So we have the lovely pleasure of being between you and your dinner. So <laughs> we'll do our very best to keep up with the first five fantastic presentations and hope to entertain you. So thank you very much for joining us on this trip to rural South Africa to have a close look at maternal health. Now, I, as the only person in my team who had no medical background and who is not from South Africa, basically asked the question, why exactly this topic? And the answer is actually a very simple one. Looking at one of the major outcomes in, of health systems all around the world, we tend to look at life expectancy. When you map all the countries in the world, you actually see a tendency or a very strong correlation between GDP per capita and life expectancy. However, shockingly, South Africa lies 15 years below the expected life expectancy a country of its GDP should have. And it's one of the most extreme outliers in the whole world. And that's in Africa's strongest economy. Also, maternal mortality has been constantly decreasing over the last 25 years. South Africa, on the other hand, is one of the, only, one of the and only five countries in the whole world to see exactly the reverse trend. So a very strong increase. So people may argue, okay, what are the reasons of it? One of the reasons may be the South Africa's quadruple burden of disease, which means while usual countries are only facing one of the following four problems, infectious diseases, as you've been speaking about, like HIV, non-communicable diseases like diabetes, injury and violence-related injury, or maternal and child mortality, Africa, South Africa is actually challenged by all four at the same time, thus massively stressing its healthcare, its healthcare um, efforts. Now, often literature or, or, main, or intuitively the answer is poverty to this, so this might be the underlying cause for all of it. In fact, yes, if you look at the left table, yes, 50% of the South African population live below a uh, financial poverty line. However, looking closely at actually what this means for them, we notice that only 11% of the South African population are actually deprived of their essential in life, meaning education, healthcare, and, and infrastructure such as sanitary and electricity. So we look closer at those who are impoverished to understand what exactly makes them deprived of their essentials. You see in gray factors such as education, in pink healthcare, and in blue infrastructure. And what we see again, it's again all about healthcare. And this is especially pronounced in rural South Africa. So that's why we decided to look at rural South Africa. And there, we chose the province of KwaZulu-Natal, where both of my colleagues have been practicing doctors, also in maternal health. And there, scoped it more specifically at the district of Umkanyakude. Because there, we, owing to their context, we could access patients, doctors, NGOs, companies, to sort of get a complete overview, which was very helpful for me as an outsider. <laughs> so how does Umkanyakude look like? Well, let's have a look at it. You see no concrete streets, no cars, not even bicycles. It's really, it's dirt roads. You see these electrical lampposts, but they're not connecting all of the houses, so actually very few are connect connected. And what have we learned? Actually, this is a very nice picture you can paint of that area. Rural South Africa can be a whole lot worse. So what does this mean? So looking at KwaZulu-Natal, there are actually a number of factors that make it quite unique in South Africa. More than half of the population are rural, and of those, three quarters of people are living in poverty. The healthcare system is in crisis. It's overburdened and it's simply run out of money to pay its doctors and nurses, which means that despite having the infrastructure of clinics and hospitals, it doesn't have the healthcare workers to staff them in order to provide the services that are required. And these services need to target a very high burden of disease, including the highest number of HIV patients on the planet. And compounding this, KwaZulu-Natal has the highest number of maternal deaths in the whole of South Africa. So during our research and speaking to people in interviews, we started to put together a picture of the typical young pregnant woman in an area like Mkanyikude. We created this fictional person we called Lorato. And in investigating people like Lorato, we started to understand that some of the circumstances that surround her are quite similar to other rural impoverished women around the world, like poor education or poor facilities. But some are quite unique to women like Lorato. The legacy of apartheid means that migrant labor is the norm meaning that men leave to go work in the major cities and leave women like Lorato behind, head of very large households, and completely dependent on their absent partners for their income. And that dependence further widens the gap between men and women and creates power imbalance. But it's not all bad. We also found that the community support in these areas is incredibly strong. One doctor that we spoke to told us a story about how two babies had been recently abandoned. But within a week, both of them had been adopted by members of the community. And this community resilience really shows how people pull together to help individuals face the problems that they, in, their, in their environment. 
And these circumstances all form an ecosystem in which Lorato lives. But what are some of the health issues that she's vulnerable to? Don't try and read all the detail. It's merely there just to show you that there are a multitude of problems, both medical and social, that pregnant women face. To try and make sense of them, we started dividing them up into factors that affect her before she's pregnant, during her pregnancy, during the birthing process, and then when she's a mother. And there are some problems that affect all women of all ages, but there are some that are particular to certain age groups. Using Lorato as an example, as an 18-year-old pregnant girl, she's particularly vulnerable to stigma and to dropping out of school and further in, in, uh, compounding the problem of, of poor education. So these are some of the problems. What about the solutions to these problems? So it comes back to Lorato and to her ecosystem. So if you look here at this map, you can see the hospital in the top corner, up to 120 kilometers away. She can't access this hospital. It's too far away. There's no transport. She can't actually afford the transport to get to this hospital. If you look a little bit closer, though, you can see there's NGOs, there's a clinic, traditional healer, and this is often only five kilometers away, far more accessible. And yet, she still doesn't access these services. She isn't finding the right solution for her needs. So we decided to map this out, understand this more clearly. And we created this landscape. We developed a matrix trying to understand this landscape more clearly. On the geographic perspective, globally, and within South Africa, and then solutions looking at female reproductive health and general health, and specifically at maternal health. And by so doing this, we realized there were many gaps in the space, and there are areas for new solutions, but there are also areas that are really being targeted well in South Africa. So let's look at South Africa more clearly. You can see there's numerous players in this space. It's a busy area. There's lots of people working to try and achieve better maternal outcomes, but it's a fragmented, land fragmented landscape. Each player is operating in a silo, not working together. They often duplicate each other's works, and you'll see some, pet, some NGOs will work, and both of them will do contraception or health education, and they don't communicate with each other and try and achieve the best solution for patients like Lorato. In other cases, problems get missed altogether, and in worse situations, NGOs and other service providers provide contradictory messages altogether. You have one NGO promoting abstinence, and the other one handing out a condom. Now, what happens to the patient? They hear these conflicting messages, they hear the two opposite sides of these, this argument, but what do they actually take out of it? Are we giving them the right solution for their needs? So it comes back to Lorato. What is Lorato facing in accessing these solutions? How can she best get to them, and how can they best get to her? There's a wall between her. There's this barrier. There's something standing between her and achieving better health. And, and so and we've spoken about the physical aspect of her accessing health. She can't get to this hospital. It's too far away. She can't afford the transport. There's also the intangible aspect, kind of the figurative aspect of access. Is she educated enough? Does she have the health knowledge to know that she needs to go to the clinic every single month to check on her unborn baby? Are there the cultural and social norms that allow her to go seek help when she needs it? And this so-called figurative or metaphorical concept of access, along with the physical or literal meaning of access, is what we termed multidimensional access. And you're trying to understand this concept of multidimensional access, the figurative and, and literal meanings, we also need to consider what happens when, as a supplier, you have to reach the patient, or the patient needs to reach the supplier and reach the solutions for their needs. To try and understand how to break down this wall, how do we dismantle this and help the solutions reach these patients, we realize there are levers, to change, levers of change that need to be implemented. So we spoke to somebody who told us about two levers of change. Either you can bring patients to healthcare, or you can bring healthcare to patients. And in so doing this, you try and reach these patients with the right solution for their needs. You're empowering the woman to receive the care they need, to have the knowledge and understand they need to seek help and achieve better health. But at the same time, in this fragmented landscape, when you're trying to bring healthcare to patients, you need to connect all of these players, take them out of their silos and break down those barriers, help them communicate and provide the right solution for these needs. There might be new solutions that we need to provide, but there are hundreds of solutions out there. There's an issue of supply and demand that people have spoken about already today. And so he described, to, described it to us as this. Be careful. Don't create too much demand, because if you don't have the right supply to meet their need, you're going to end up at an impasse. And that's exactly it. There's this fine balance. You have the supply and you have the demand. And unless you find the balance between each of these, how do you provide the right solution for patients like Lorato and get through this wall? And that's what it comes down to. If you see, there's all of these solutions. And people are trying to achieve this, and yet they still aren't getting through. How do we actually get through this wall? It comes back to Lorato. We have to understand what Lorato goes through. We have to understand what this wall means for her. 
What are the very bricks that make up this world that stop her from accessing better healthcare, from improving her outcomes, from being a stronger and better mother? And in trying to understand this wall and how to get through to it from both sides, we can truly help people like Loretta. It's a complex problem. And we realized we thought when we came there, we, we thought we were the pros. We're doctors from South Africa. We've worked in maternal health in rural KZN. We knew this problem. We understood it. We knew the right solution for patients like Loretta. And yet the further and further we dived into this, we realized we didn't have the right solution. It was far more complicated than we could have ever thought. And the only way you can actually realize it and understand this is by going to areas like Mkanyakude, to rural KZN. Spend a day in the life of Lorato, understand what these barriers are, what is stopping her from getting her better health care. And only by so and do this can you actually help her. Women like Lorato are the very glue that bind our society. And as we spend this day here in Nelson Mandela's theater, the man that started this movement 20 years ago, and he started the work towards helping mothers like Lorato, and we are here to help continue that journey. And through this work, we hope that we can continue to save mothers like Loretta. Thank you. Thank you, Oxford, to our judges. I thank you so much for that presentation. Um, and you highlight this fragmentation very clearly, of all, and the fact that there are so many solutions, but for some reason there's a wall. And coming to that conclusion, I wondered if, in terms of bringing all those providers together, what challenges you foresee in that, if any? I think there are a number of challenges. The first being what we've highlighted here, is that we don't actually know what that barrier is between the service providers and um, and the patients. There are over 3,000 NGOs working in the space and everybody has their idea of what the solution is but no one actually understands why it's not working. So I think the first challenge is to investigate that, do some qualitative research, speaking to women, interviewing women and the people that influence them to try and figure out what those bricks in that wall are. So that's the first challenge. Secondly, things bringing people together, obviously there's all these NGOs are in competition for the limited amount of funds that are available to roll out these projects. So that's one issue. The other is, again, everybody thinks that their idea is the best. So getting people to collaborate is not always easy. Um, and egos get in the way. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> so you are doctors. You have worked in the region. I'm, I applaud your humility. Um, I'm interested, what are some of the surprising discoveries you made in, in going through this process that you perhaps might not have expected or even go against um, your natural inclinations? So actually, when we started the process, we started by talking to doctors, well, friends of ours that actually worked in this area. And we came in thinking, look, these women are poor, they can't get to the clinic, they don't know they need to go, there's no clinics available. And we had this very well kind of drawn out image of what was going on. And the further and further we looked at it, they actually said, look, there are hospitals, there are clinics. The clinic's only five kilometers away, but yet the patients aren't actually going to the clinics. What's standing between them and, and seeking care? And even one of the patients we spoke to, she said, look, I go to the hospital, I know the hospital provides me with the right care, but she's not going to the clinic every single month for her, her baby. And like we said, the multidimensional access is all these concepts. Does she know she needs to go? Is it important to her? On the day of delivery, when she's in labor and feels the pain, she knows it's important because it's her baby's life at that moment. But those nine months before that, how important is it to her? I think that's one of the first barriers is actually education and these social and cultural norms and these intangible aspects of access. Until you break down those barriers, you can't make any progress. And that's, yeah, that was probably one of our biggest realizations. I think one of the things that also really surprised me was, again, we, we went in thinking we knew everything, and we said, well, they have poor outcomes, they must not have the resources. Look at all these vulnerable, poor women. And when we researched it, we actually found, yes, they're vulnerable, and yes, they're poor, but they actually have a lot of resilience that you don't expect. You know, um, community support groups and religion plays a huge role in, in these women's lives and, and in the men. And sort of community leaders is something that is very important and is lost when you look at hospitals in the cities that communities just don't have the same support. So I think that was a, a point that people are vulnerable, but you have to also assess what, what capabilities they actually do have so that you can lever leverage those. 
And the last one for me, for example, as an outsider, I made a wrong assumption basically considering the attitude. Con because you always read about what NGOs tell you in UNICEF and, and et cetera, and yeah, they rather have some traditional heater, heater than Western medicine. That's completely wrong. They, they'd rather go, they'd actually rather go to a doctor than to a traditional healer. It's just out of la that we get again to this multidimensional access. Why don't they go? And then we found out basically understaffed hospital or clinics is maybe the wrong word. You can imagine an empty building. It's there, it's equipped, there's no one there to run it. And, and those are things I was completely oblivious about, especially with the maybe typical Western bias <laughs> towards this. It was very eye-opening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.